So one day, I got a phone call from a very nice lady. She said she uh, was 84 years old. Her name was Nancy, and she liked to make art with paper. She told me that she got this machine called a plotter that would cut out paper in a very intricate way, but she couldn't quite figure out how to use it. And she made me a deal. She said, if you teach me how to use it, I'll give it to you. Well, I thought, wow, that's a pretty good deal. So I made an arrangement to go to Nancy's house, as expected. I was greeted very warmly and kindly and welcomed in, and we began to discuss this machine and also some other things she wanted to give to us. Then she asked me, do you want to see my art? I thought to myself, okay. Sadly, the only thing that could come to mind was like doilies or like those old snowflakes you used to cut out of paper. I came around the corner into her living room, and what I saw there literally took my breath away. Because what she had made out of paper were small size wedding dresses and baptismal gowns that looked like they were made out of lace and silks, and each one of them had a light bulb inside of it that gave it this kind of transcendent magical glow, and then she began to tell me that all of these dresses, each one of them represented a memory. I found myself like, where in the world am I? And almost a little embarrassed like I'd kind of snuck behind, you know, the VIP curtain and I was somewhere I shouldn't be because I had expected to come meet Nancy, the 85-year-old lady with the machine. And lo and behold, I was meeting Nancy, this wonderful, magical superhero with superpowers that no one seemed to know about. They just saw Nancy as this old lady, but all along, she was a superstar. She's actually become a very good friend and an, and a, an amazing inspiration to me. Maybe you're asking yourself, so Mike, why are you getting phone calls from 84-year-old women? <laughs> <laughs> well, she had heard about a makerspace that we just opened. Our makerspace is a very simple idea, kind of like a gym or a training studio where you buy a membership and you can use all the machines, the equipment, you can take courses, you can even get a private trainer, only at Makerspace, it's not about exercise, thankfully. <laughs> it's about making things. Our core model, our model from the beginning was to remove the blockers. You know, all the things that stop us from actually entering into this process of making things. Simple things like not having the right tools or machines or not having space not having time or knowledge. So our idea was that for a good price, we could offer people access to those things and allow them to start simply making again. And whatever they made, whether they made a shelf or they wanted to redesign a dress or they wanted to use the latest technology and robotics to make the thing that was gonna change the world to us, it doesn't matter because what we value is this magical process of going from idea to reality. One moment, something doesn't exist, and the next moment it does. That's pretty cool. So we opened about five, six months ago, and I remember um, the first day we opened, I had a guy come in. He was probably late 30s, early 40s. He came in and started asking me lots of questions about the makerspace, and eventually I asked him the same question I ask everybody that I meet at at this space, so what do you like to make? He stood there, he kind of looked down, he said, well, actually, I can't say as I've ever made anything in my life. I said, well, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Go look around, so he did, he came back about 30 minutes later, he was like, Mike, okay, this is so cool, I've signed up for my membership. I'd like to start with wood. I'd like to take a lesson in wood and then ceramics. I'd like to take one in uh, uh, textile, uh, electronics, and I'd also like to learn how to 3D print. Can I take more than one course at a time? I said, of course you can. Because sometimes when we see the process, it ignites something inside of us. As a culture, we've become so far removed from the actual making process. We think our phones are just stamped out. We think clothes just magically appear in our stores, but they don't. They're made somewhere by someone. And when we come into an environment where we see that process, when we see a, a potter's wheel, 
And you see a lump of clay slowly, magically become a cup or a vase or a bowl. It moves something inside of us. When you see a piece of square wood on a lathe and it's spinning and with a gentle touch of a tool, it becomes intricate art. It stirs this instinctive desire in us to make stuff. But sadly, not everybody is affected the same way by that process. A few days later, I had two women come in. One of them was a rather uh, accomplished artist in the area, and her friend came along, and she was asking me many questions. But most of the time, the other lady stayed rather silent. At the end of our discussion, of course, I turned to her. And I said, well, what about you? What do you think? She said, oh, no, 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 this isn't for me. This is for people like her. I'm so not creative. I love when people say that to me. Because I can look them in the face and say, no, that is simply not true. Saying that you're not creative is like saying, I can't do a sit-up because I have no stomach muscles. Come on, we all have stomach muscles. Most of us haven't been using them like we should, but we could do a sit-up because we have stomach muscles. Creativity is what makes us human. It's what is embedded in our very DNA. But sadly, for many reasons, for many of us, this process of curiosity, wonder, idea, and expression has been blocked, hindered, and for many, crushed. So for what I suggest she meant was I haven't used my creativity in so long that I'm afraid to try. So for people like her, and there's a lot of us, we need to lower the threshold for entry. We need to make it as non-threatening as possible. For example, when we first started our process of trying to find a space that we could use, we saw, uh, I started looking at a building on an island next to our city called Odreya, <laughs> which is an, it was an old uh, military base that has been repurposed to be used for culture and art. It's an amazing place with workshops, galleries, but we realized quickly that if we put ourselves there, most people would think to themselves, oh, it must be for artists. That's not for me. If we were too established and connected to the local university, there's a group of people, a large, that would say, oh no, that must be for the educated. That's not for me. Too attached to the entrepreneur house in the city. And again, oh, it must be for them, not for me. We wanted to create a space, and we have, that is accessible by all of them but owned by none of them because our maker space is for everybody. Somehow we've bought into this idea that the, that the innovations and the ideas that we need for the future are most likely only gonna come from the largest institutions, the most well-educated, and those with access to the most money. But what if what if we can move our focus away from what is a very small portion of the population that have all those things and offer this creative, innovative process to everyone? That we can instill in people the belief that if you have an idea, you have a table to bring it to and that it will actually become real the possibilities really start to open up. And that's why in our makerspace, we decided from the beginning we would be for the broadest possible community of people. It's why we started with lots of things, as many things as we could. We started with wood, metal, electronics, pottery, textile, and digital fabrication, like 3D printing and laser cutters. I wanted to start with food, but we didn't have enough money. <laughs> um, when we have this community, we are able to welcome people in. And then we're able to focus on making sure that we gather women and men. We, we go after 
young and old. We go after the educated and the self-educated. In an environment like that, we have people like, we have Christophorus, who is uh, an (laughs) ex-Orthodox priest who loves to take a tree And without the use of electricity or glue or nails or screws, he likes to turn it into something else. He loves and is engaged with the ancient traditions of our ancestors. We also have a guy named Maximilian who's a student and who has this amazing gift to take things onto a computer and make it into this 3D image and have it printed out by 3D printer or have it made on our our CNC router. He loves the newest technology. And when you can take ancient traditions and skills and mix them with new technology, and not just the machines, but the people, and when they start to collaborate, it's magical. And when I say magical, I like magic. And when I started this process, I thought that the magic of our makerspace would be that people would make really cool stuff. You know, we get rid of the blockers, give them the tools, and they start making really cool stuff because they had access to tools. But quickly, I learned that that wasn't the magic at all. It's just a, a side effect or a ripple effect of the real magic because it's not about making stuff and access to tools. It's about relationships and access to people. When we remove the blockers between us. Three months or so before we even opened, I had a visit from a guy. He was part of an art collective in Oslo. And they learned how to weld and to cast. And over eight years, they built a 40-foot sailboat out of aluminum. (laughs) Very cool. They sailed to Christiansand, and the captain was there, and he, we, got, we met somehow, and he came over to my space, and we began discussing how we could set up a, a metal lab. At the same time, a friend of mine, who's a complete IT nerd, you know, he used to tell me about bitcoins before I could even use Google, you know, those kind of guys. <laughs> they, he came in at the same time, and we began to talk, the three of us, and pretty soon the two of them began to talk so much that I just went back to work. <laughs> three weeks later, I found out that my IT friend became part of the crew sailing that ship from Christiansand to Scotland. And when he came back, he was so excited because they were going to put microchips all over that boat and get real-time evaluation of what was happening, and they were planning a trip to South America. A connection that shouldn't have happened. A connection that is oftentimes the exception. But we believe that that should no longer be the exception but the norm. Because when you enter into an environment that draws this crazy variety of people, what it does is it forces us, no, of course not, it allows us to break outside of our cultural bubbles and begin to meet people that we would have never met before. I have seen the highest educated engineers collaborating with anarchist backroom tech nerds I've seen retired metal workers collaborating with textile redesign artist ladies. I've seen some of of our region's most famous artists learning from retired art teachers. See, when we limit who we know, we limit who we are. And in this process, I have to honestly say that I've seen time and time again my own deep-rooted prejudice. How oftentimes I put people into a box based on completely superficial details. But luckily for me and for them, they break out of those boxes every time. I remember meeting the leader of the far, kind of the far-right uh, political party in Christiansand where I'm from. I met him in the middle of the city, and he said, oh, hey, Mike, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm making a makerspace. Told him real quick. It was starting to rain in the middle of the city. Put down his bags. For 30 minutes, he told me about an idea that he had 10 years ago of something that he wanted to make, and at the end, he said, can I be a member? 
I said, of course you can. When I met the, the local, there's a lady that runs the local fabric shop. And I told her about it and she was so excited because for 20 years she was a furniture carpenter and had been longing to get back into the wood shop. The guy that sells cameras at the local camera shop turned out to be a design prototyping genius and now heads up our prototyping lab. I can tell you hundreds of stories of people that have shown me that there is something powerful inside of us that can be revealed and released if we're given the right environment. And of course, it doesn't have to be a maker space. It has to be a, a space that's open, including welcoming, where we can learn over time to see each other, and to be seen by each other. I tell you, in that kind of an environment, we're going to make some really cool stuff. And we're going to see innovation spring up before our eyes magically that's going to have a profound effect on us economically, socially, culturally, and will also make life just a whole lot more fun. But more than that, we will begin to see each other not as educated, uneducated, men, women, grandpas and kids and foreigners and refugees and rich and poor and all those things, will begin to slowly see each other like I've come to see Nancy. As superheroes with sometimes undiscovered, undeveloped, underappreciated, Powerful, powerful superpowers. If we can see each other like that and ourselves, and if we can start to release those powers, not only will we change the world, we will change absolutely everything. Thank you.